you, uh, thank you for having me here. I'd like to share with you uh, two short pieces, one from each of my novels. The first one, The River Where Blood is Born, is a uh, novel about, it's a family saga that follows eight generations of black women from Africa, freedom in Africa, to slavery in the Americas, uh, from the uh, 17th century on up to the present. And it um, tells the story of this family through the mothers and the daughters. Um, so the first daughter to uh, make the journey uh, is a daughter who names herself Diaspora. Are you familiar with that term, Diaspora? What does it mean? Um, it's when you spread out, right? Yeah. yeah. It's the scattering, the dispersal of a, a group of people from their homeland to wherever they're found in the world. So there's an Irish diaspora and a Jewish diaspora. This is the story of the African diaspora. And just to set up this voice, um, a young woman uh, has been captured into slavery in what is now the modern nation of Ghana in West Africa. And she's heavily pregnant. Um, she's on board a slave ship and does not want to give birth. But she does. And this is the voice of her newly born daughter, a daughter named Diaspora. If I could tell my story, I would. If I had a voice in my mouth that I could command, others would know my name. I have only just come into being. But this is what I know of the world. From inside my vessel, I knew such a rocking, a heavy sway in my way of water. But now I am without her, the vessel that held me in a stormy peace for my time. My mother did not want to give me to this world. Though I am new, this I know. She did not want to deliver me from the place that had come, become too small to contain me. She did not want to surrender me, though I demanded to be free. She wanted to keep me inside her as a ship trapped in the belly of a bottle. Even though I had broken the cork and spilled the water, even though I twisted, struggled to make my way out. She pressed her knees together and did not howl against the pain. The pain is regular in the heartbeat. So I made my way to the neck and beat at the opening. She dug her nails into rotting wood and would not push, would not move. I called, but she would not release me from the place that had become a prison. So I pushed my own way out, slithered through the neck of the vessel and out of the opening. I gave birth to myself. And though I have escaped from my vessel, I find myself still within a vessel. It is like a huge cradle of splintered wood that rocks and sways. It is a cradle rocked by wind and water. And I am not the only one here who cries for food to fill me or for dark arms to hold me. I am not the only one here who moans. Perhaps I have been delivered from one prison to another. But now that I am here, I am beginning to know the world. I know neither my father's name nor my own, but I do know her. Dark as night sky, rivers flowing from her breasts and eyes, I have come to know other things too, the taste of sweet water that comes before the milk, the thick black sky at night that is so like the dark place I have come from, but it is not a close darkness. It is a far darkness that is studded with lights I can see, but not touch. I am in the world now and she holds me to herself, cuddling me in a cloth of many colors. I know that she would return me to eternity, would offer us both to the spirits and wide blue waters that surge around us, but I know that she will not, for though I am new, I know that we have some destiny to play out at the end of our passage. 
I fear that I will not have long to know her. I think that she knows this too, for she stares hungrily at me. My hands, my body, my eyes. She plucks me from her breast to closely examine my face as if to remember it now so that she will know me again. And perhaps this knowledge is why she has not yet named me. To give name to that which is not yours to keep is to hasten the moment and sharpen the pain of the separation. So I am wise and the wisdom of newness, the ancient wisdom I must lose only to seek again, but I am nameless. And since she will not name me, I name myself, Dias. You may not remember my face, you may never hear my story, so I have left it here for the time after I am gone. A sweet water song, salt water blues, it whispers in the waves of this wide, wide river. It has sifted through leagues of sea and settled into sand. It is in the current that begins in a surge at one shore and ends in a wave at another. And my voice is just one among many. I'm not the only one here who sings or moans. We are not lost. We are not nameless. We are not silent. Listen if you pass this way, traveler. Hear us. So that is a daughter named Diaspora from the river where blood is born. And then uh, Professor Bell uh, mentioned something about uh, female genital mutilation, also called female circumcision, which is a, a topic that I try to deal with in Hot Johnny and the Women Who Loved Him. Most of the stories that I tell as a fiction writer are stories about black women. Even the story about the man is ultimately a story about the women in his life. And one of the women, Hot Johnny, as you might imagine by his name, is a lover a uh, man who has this irresistible attraction to and for women, but there are different types of love that he inspires. Uh, this story of his life is told by 18 different women, and one of them is a woman he calls Mother Africa. Her uh, name is actually Malaika, which means angel in Swahili. And she is a woman that he meets when uh, he is a, um, at a point in his life, he, after you know, a youth in the streets and that sort of thing, he becomes a, a, uh, an airman. He jo joins the Air Force and serves in uh, Somalia. There's in the 1990s, there was this military, op well, it was, it was a humanitarian operation called Operation Restore Hope that became military. And so this is where they meet, Malaita and Hajani. And part of her story uh, that she tells about Johnny is her own story. So I'll just start here. She is a, a um, academic. She's an anthropologist. Um, and a feisty sort of woman. Despite the things they have said about me, I am a lover, not a fighter. Kikuyus, which is her ethnic group from Kenya, are farmers and cattle people. Not warriors, if I have had to fight since early adolescence, it was always for a reason. I have always feared the sight of blood. I could never watch the cattle being slaughtered, although I had no trouble later eating the meat. I knew one day I would have to see my own blood spilled to spread my legs before the circumciser's knife. It was an inevitable reality I could not bring myself to face until that time drew near. This was my culture, after all. Everyone knew and understood if she wanted to become a wife and mother, a Kikuyu woman must be circumcised. I had been an obedient daughter up until then, but the last straw is the last straw. I was being measured for new clothes when I heard that the women were planning a circumcision ceremony in my honor. For all the Nubo village girls, I made the first adult decision of my life. With a few shillings in my pocket, I 
fled. Somehow, I made my way to Nairobi. I had a paternal cousin there whom I had grown up calling Auntie. Everyone at home knew Makindu as a prostitute. When you resist mutilation and arrange marriage, you are lucky if that is all they say of you. When they found me there and brought me home, I refused to submit. I fought. I cursed. I faked suicide. I threatened to run again. The ceremonies would not be delayed by the antics of one recalcitrant rebel. The ritual knife was wielded. The blood of my aged mate flowed. The dances were danced. New clothes were worn. Praise songs were sung. The disgruntled circumciser wrapped her bundle and left. She could not be persuaded to tarry. But my rebellion had a price tag. Like Auntie Makindu, I had earned a new title. Village children would follow me, pelting me with stones and chants. There is a whole repertoire of songs insulting the genitals of uncircumcised women. Unable to bear the humiliation, my parents sent me away to a mission boarding school. So, I learned to be a warrior. That early act of defiance not only preserved my body, but ensured my education. When I return to my village now, I find that yet another of those stone throwers has resisted.